All right, I believe it's recording. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Brennan Snyder. Thank you for joining me. Uh, right off the bat, I'd like to ask if you're new to my channel and you haven't already hit the subscribe button to go ahead and click the button, uh, leave a comment, hit like, all those things help support my channel. I would greatly appreciate it. And of course, as an added bonus, you'll be able to stay up to date on all that's going on in the world of music, just like this. Today, we are gonna be talking about the best albums of the 80s by the best hard rock bands of the 80s. Now, first up, I'd like to introduce my guest. I've got Chris Profi from Musically Obsessed. Uh, Chris, if you will, just uh, tell us a little bit about your channel because you've got a YouTube channel and I'd like all my subscribers to come over and check you out. Definitely. Well, thank you, Brennan, for having me on. I, I, I enjoy your channel. I love watching your channel. So this is an honor to be talking with you and discussing what we love, right? 80s, uh, 80s hard rock bands. So Absolutely. yes, um, as Brennan was saying, I'm, uh, my channel is Chris Profi Musically Obsessed. And I've been doing videos on YouTube for about a year and a half. Um, I discuss uh, not only CDs, but as you can see behind me, I've got uh, vinyl as well. I've got about 700 records. So I've got a, a big library to discuss. Um, I also have cassettes too. So, you know, I kind of do all formats, CD, vinyl, cassettes. I don't have any eight tracks, but um, <laughs> you know, well, that's, that's one area that um, I was going to point out to, to my subscribers is that I'm predominantly a CD person and I get a lot of comments about vinyl. I don't have a big vinyl collection. I basically have vinyl that is not available on CD or not available on cassette, and I will purchase the vinyl for that reason. Right. But uh, for those of you, my subscribers that are watching this, that are always asking about the vinyl, Chris Profi is a great person to go check out, does a lot on vinyl. So our two channels can work in tandem with each other uh, in that method. And then I don't know, did you mention you also play guitar and you do live uh, recordings as well? Yes, I play guitar. Uh, I'm a songwriter, a singer. I do. I I post guitar videos every once in a while. Where sometimes I'll sing an original song. I'm a huge Johnny Cash fan, so I'll do Johnny Cash songs. Um, a little bit of everything. I just kind of want to piggyback on what you said. I love CDs still. Mm -hmm. I have like over three thousand CDs. I still buy CDs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am not really married to one uh, media. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, you're going to see everything with me as well, but I totally, I support CDs. I like, I like music in any great. physical format. So yeah, no, I'm the same way. Physical format for me is the way to go. I, I yeah. do stream. I do have, uh, you know, an Apple music account. Uh, mainly yeah. that's for me, you know, being on the go, listening to yeah. it at work. I of course love the immediacy of being able to download and listen to something right away, mm -hmm. but it'll never take away from that act of holding the album in your hand, flipping through it, seeing the art and listening to it all at the same time. Definitely. I mean, think back to when we were kids, like if you wanted to hear something, you couldn't just go on a Spotify or YouTube or right. anything. Either you had to hear it on the radio, right. sit it on Headbangers Ball, yeah. or your friend had to have the cassette, you know? So now it's easy. Right. And, and I agree with you though. Like I Like a lot of times when I listen to something streaming, I don't enjoy it as much as when I physically have it. So yeah. it's the whole, it's feeling it and seeing it and putting it in the player and then absorbing and, and internalizing it. And, you know, I think it's how we grew up. And I think right. what's good about this is we're teaching hopefully younger people that, hey, there's another way to enjoy music. Right, absolutely. Um, now I'm the same way, listening to it uh, through the headphones, uh, streaming wise doesn't seem to connect nearly as much with me as when I come yeah. home, put on that CD, sit in front of the stereo and listen to it in that regard and can really absorb it. So definitely that's, that's the way I'm always going to be. And, uh, you know, and I still have a CD player in my car. I know a lot of cars. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm proud. I take that CD. I put it in it, before I leave for work. I pick which CDs I want to listen to. And right. yeah, so I'm old school, but I love it. All right. Good. Well, there you go. So I uh, hope everyone will stop by and check out uh, Chris Profi, Musically Obsessed. Uh, but we're here today. We're going to talk about uh, the best albums by the best 80s uh, rock bands. And uh, this is sort of a roundtable discussion. And uh, we're going to each uh, talk about our favorite album by a particular band. Now, there were some criteria that we set up at the beginning of this. Uh, we predetermined the 10 classic bands that we're going to talk about. And obviously, there's 
far more classic and great bands out there from the 80s, and we're not going to hit them all here today. We'll save that for another go round, but we are focusing on hard rock specifically. Uh, we're excluding metal and thrash and alternative, and certainly some of the bands we're going to bring up today could you know, ride the line and, and be in one category or the other kind of a thing. But in order to try to help us focus and limit this down so that we're hitting, uh, uh, you know, just these specific ones, we set this up. And then the other thing being that the album, of course, had to be released between 1980 and 1989. It uh, doesn't matter when within there, if you could have been released uh, December 1989, it still makes the category of an 80s hard rock album. All right, and with that being said, uh, first band up that we're going to talk about is one of the biggest hard rock bands, I think, in all of uh, hard rock, I mean, music in general, ACDC. All right, and for me, the album that I chose, I think it's the best one out of their 80s catalog, and I know this one is going to be controversial. Uh, it's Fly on the Wall. Um, I think a lot of people would expect, of course, uh, Back in Black, and, you know, that one came right in there, and certainly uh, some of the other ones. But at least for me, this one here, I think rocks from start to finish. Not that other albums don't. Uh, for me, this album is not worn out. Uh, a lot of the other, you know, singles, hits, those things are, and that may be part of it for me. I do like those songs. But the other thing that I think why this album has always stood out to me more than anything is uh, the music for it was used in the Stephen King movie, um, Maximum Overdrive. Um, and then it was also on, of course, the soundtrack, Who Made Who, right? And that's a big album by them as well. So it's like three opportunities to be hearing music off of this album kind of a thing. And uh, I don't know, but for me, even years later now, I mean, this uh, was uh, 1985. So here we are, 35 years, 36 years on from this release. I'm still not tired of it. So it's uh, my top choice out of the, uh, the 80s for them. I'm glad you showed that, though, because that's my second favorite ACDC album. And you're right. When most people think of ACDC, they're going to Back in Black or mm -hmm. Highway to Hell right. or you know, even for those about to rock. Right. And those are great albums. But I don't know. There's something about that mid-80s period and Fly on the Wall. It's a fun album. I love the cover yeah. work. Right. A lot of people don't like that. And I actually I love, love the artwork on this. I mean... I always love the little fly and then it's in the exact right spot if you flip it over, you know, you, to see the back of it. Just little thing, things like that on this that I always loved about it. Well, it's got a great 80s vibe. The production is awesome. The cover artwork always reminded me of like a campground for some reason, mm -hmm. like fly on the wall of a camp. And right. then it gets me thinking of some of those 80s movies like, you know, Meatballs and... right. You know, Friday the 13th and all that Freeway kind of camp. Stuff. Yeah, all of those. Yeah, it's just got that. It just brings back those good feelings. And then accompanied with the music. It's just that that's why that album is always going to be top for me. Second, second favorite. Okay. So, all right. So uh, leading in then, which album did you choose? Well, I chose the one that came out right before that 1983's Flick of the Switch. Fantastic. Absolutely. It's and I've gone on record saying, no, and no pun intended, that this is my favorite album by ACDC. Mm -hmm. I have it on vinyl as well. So, um, you know, I, as a kid, I got turned on to ACDC because of Back in Black, like a lot of us did. And then, you know, I, of course, really liked For Those About to Rock. But then I heard this, and, um, and this whole, and what I really like about this is the album has, it flows from the beginning to the end. Right. It's like set up this feeling. Mm -hmm. It starts with rising power yep. and it continues all the way to brain shake. It's upbeat. It's heavy. Like I, we all know what we're going to hear with ACDC, but right. there's no surprise in that, but right. But this album really has a nice flow to it. And um, I just feel like every song is really, really good. Flick of the switch, nervous shakedown, landslide deep in the hole. I think, you know, the, the double entendres, everything that ACDC is known for, you know, great guitar work. Uh, it's just all in here. I mean, I agree. It, it's right along the lines of Fly on the Wall, too. Right. Um, so, you know, ask me on a Tuesday, maybe I'll say Fly on the Wall is my favorite. Ask me on a Wednesday, it'll be this. But for the most part, this is my favorite. 
Yeah, I, I could have easily gone with a Flick of the Switch. That's one of my other favorite ones. I go back to the, to these two albums. If I listen to yeah. one, I'm always listening to the other one. They just go hand in hand for me. They've got that same sort of feeling. I think you hit the nail on the head. You, you know, it's a, it is a fun album. Both of these are from start to finish, and they yeah. feel really well. Some of the other ones have uh, more peaks and valleys, and there might be a particular track I don't care for as much kind of a thing. But right. these, from start to finish, I like every song on them, on them nonstop. I'm going to say, though, Fly on the Wall is a bold choice because yeah. I, I mean, I'm supporting you on that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of ACDC fans might be like, Fly on the Wall? Really? Yeah. You well, have total support. That album is kicks ass. Big I, I, I did a, a separate uh, uh, best, uh, the best, you know, like top 10 countdown of Brian Johnson era albums yeah and um god i'm trying to even remember what what i did have at number one but my number two was fly on the wall um yeah. kind of a thing and it was like i went through them all and, and it wasn't uh you know back in blacks not not my number one kind of thing i mean even after all these years i tend to think a lot of that for me though is just the the overplayed ness of it it's if you're going to turn on the radio or someone's going to play it or it's going to be in a movie it's going to be one of those songs kind of a thing and i've just heard yeah. it to death yeah. um but you know these other albums that they've got they're just tremendous stuff hidden away on these things and yeah fly on the wall man if, if i'm pulling out only one acdc album to listen to it's going to be that one i agree with you and, I, and on tuesdays i will pull that out yeah <laughs> uh, day, no i'm just kidding no, but that is a that is a killer record, though. Both of these albums are killer. Yeah, so. absolutely. I'll be listening yeah. to it later tonight, I'm sure. All right, yeah. next up, we've got uh, what I'm calling uh, the 70s Comeback Kings, Aerosmith, right? Big, huge band throughout the 70s, but equally made a huge comeback in the 80s. Um, so, Chris, I'll let you go first on this one. Who did you, or what album did you select by them? Well, I want to first say I got into Aerosmith because of Run DMC and Walk This Way. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who Aerosmith was before that. I didn't even know they had like 70 stuff as a kid, you know, so I just really liked Walk This Way, Run DMC. Right. And then I forget year, what year what that was, but. Yeah, 85, 86. It led me to, yeah, it led me to Permanent Vacation. Uh, mm -hmm. This 1987 album. I got to say that this is their best. I mean. Yeah. It's got all the hits on here. Ragdoll, Dude Looks Like a Lady, um, Angel. Um, but, you know, the deeper tracks are awesome, too. Permanent Vacation and I'm Down and, uh, you know, Magic Touch. It opens up with Hearts Done Time. Right. You know, I think, um, looking at some of their, I think they were sort of uh, floundering for a bit there. You know, they came out with Rock in a Hard Place. Right. Dunk Mirrors was good because of uh, Let the Music Do the Talking. Right. I feel like that's the best song on that album. It is. Uh, My and, Fix Your Face and those others just don't don't connect for me on it. And I don't know who produced those albums, but this is produced by Bruce Fairburn. It was Mike Klink, I think. Okay, I so think have to check. Bruce Fairburn basically knew how to produce Aerosmith and how to get the best out of them. And I feel like they reinvented themselves and um, they sort of solidified where they were going to go from here because obviously what followed with pump and everything and um mm. what's the one with a cow on it i forget oh uh, get a grip yeah get a grip get a grip right um so they would go to bigger and better things but this you're was, right I, started it yeah so yeah, this i one, think that one kicked it off yeah this will be my always be my favorite 80s uh, aerosmith album so, yeah so for me on, on on that i i thought about selecting that one but for me, I, I don't feel that that album is as consistent. Okay. And, uh, for me, at least, what makes a top album is however many songs are on it, but start to finish, every single song I like. And right. they get a little more bluesy on some of those songs on there. So for me, that one didn't uh, just didn't quite hit the, the mark, even though it's got, yeah. uh, like you said, Ragdoll, Dude Looks Like a Lady. I love mm -hmm. Angel. It's one of the best power ballad songs ever oh, on yeah. there. Uh, Magic Touch 2, always like that one, even though it's a deep cut. Right. But for me, at least, um, I opted to go with Pump. Uh, no, this one here, just uh, the one-two punch, Young Lust and Fine right off the bat. 
Um, the other thing about this particular album, and you're right, the, the groundwork was set by Permanent Vacation. There wouldn't be a pump without that because uh, Done With Mirrors, to me, is just generic. Yeah. It's, it's a great album, but in terms of Aerosmith, it's pretty generic. Yeah. And, um, you know, the Let the Music Do the Talking song, I mean, that was a Joe Perry's project solo song. So it wasn't like it was written for that album anyways. And for the best track to actually be a redo of a Joe Perry solo song, right. you know, to me kind of didn't say much about the album, but uh, Permanent Vacation, yeah, set the, the bar and really kind of defined what they were going to do and who they were going to be. But I just felt like this album here was the culmination of it, that it really came yeah. together on this. And one of the things that I, I really liked about this record is that, you know, the lyrics of Aerosmith, uh, the double entendres, the tongue in cheek, all that sort of stuff, uh, but the music too, uh, you know, the amazing work that uh, both Joe Perry working with Steven Tyler, the keyboard playing, all that sort of stuff, I think really came together on this. And so I always felt like, you know, the song that the sort of sexy song had the um, sultry lyrics and they went hand in hand and the uh, more dramatic song had the thought provoking, you know, music with it kind of a thing where lyrically and musically these things really lined up on this album more so than I felt on any other album. And that's ultimately why I went with this one here. Yeah, I mean, I, and I'm not going to argue with you because that's an amazing album and it has so many. I mean, that's basically Aerosmith's hysteria. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Right, seven, because seven million copies. So many, yeah, right. and, and I mean, I think every song on that album was. It seemed like it could have been a single. Uh, so yeah, it's. Uh, you're right, production wise, songwriting wise, what started with Permanent Vacation. You're right, it's sort of solidified with that, and I think it got kind of lost on Get a Grip a little bit. In so, my opinion, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and and I agree with you for whatever re for whatever reason I just sort of identify with this. But I mean, again, I'm not going to argue with you with that one. I mean, that pump is <laughs> a great album. I, I think I mean I think a lot of people will find you know certainly I know that these albums have a lot to do with when we found yeah. them, when we got them, and the age that we were, and whether or not um, you know for me, Permanent Vacation was a cassette that I got from my brother. It was a hand. Right. It wasn't my first. My first Aerosmith is this album, right? Yeah. So that's probably why I tend to lean towards this one because it really was my own versus, mm -hmm. you know, something that, that I got in another way or found another way kind of a thing. But I do think that, you know, when you find that, you know, what might be your first album by a band is always going to be your first love regardless right. of how successful the actual album is and you made a good point you know saying this is like the hysteria for uh, Aerosmith yeah. and it's true I mean this album did seven million in sales and it had three top 10 singles on it right. um, you know it's it's tied for number two Toys in the Attic is their number one all-time selling yeah. record but uh, this one and Get a Grip both are seven million sales just in the U.S. so yeah and, you know, there are a lot of Aerosmith fans that don't like the 80s stuff. Like, they would look at you and I and say, Permanent Vacation and Pump, those albums stink. Like, right. more of into, like, rocks and, you know, Toys mm -hmm. in the Attic and, you know, Draw the Line and stuff right. like that. Because it's got that blues quality to it, sure. almost like the Rolling Stones type stuff. Um, well, they've got, like, definitely two different phases. Two yeah. Different. You know, they've got the, the straight on bluesy hard rock of the 70s and then the more polished 80s yeah. into the mid 90s sound. And you had mentioned the blues of this album. I feel like maybe this could have been like a nice bridge for some of those older fans and the newer fans, you know? Oh, I mean? yeah. Is it I, the, the song on there? I think it's what it's called Hangman's Jury. Hangman's Jury, yep. Yeah. I mean, that, that one there is a perfect one for that. Uh, yeah. It's like another train kept a rolling kind of song. Well, I know that this is not an 80s album, but we're talking about Aerosmith. They had that album Honkin' on Bobo. Yes. Which is just all blues. Right. So if anybody has never heard that and you like bluesy Aerosmith, definitely check out Honkin' on Bobo. Yeah. And Jack Richardson produces it. So yeah. Went back to a, you know, the guy that did all their stuff in the 70s. Right. All right. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about uh, the German rockers Scorpions. And uh, I think this one, too, is going to be another uh, controversial one. But I went with Savage Amusement. 
I chose right. not to go with their big albums that have all the hits on them and things like that. And I will say for this uh, roundtable discussion and selecting this, I, I spent a good amount of time yesterday and today listening to like not only Savage Amusement, but listening to Love at First Sting um, mm. and the other albums of the 80s and just sort of like confirming, no, I really want to go with this one here. So um, this one in particular is just for me, bombastic, over the top. Um, while yes, there's bigger hit singles like Rocky Like a Hurricane and um, others like those, Big City Night, stuff like that, that I know have bigger um staying power than this album here i feel like every one of the songs on here is an anthem feels like yeah. an anthem kind of a thing and uh the opening the three opening tracks on here don't stop at the top rhythm of love and passion rules the game mm -hmm. i mean to me it's just amazing and uh but you know it doesn't it's not like it crests either at the beginning of that for me it just stays all the way through to the end and then it's got uh, believe in love at the end which i think is one of the strongest power ballads kind of things that they ever did yeah. um so yeah i had to i had to go with this one and i i know that it's uh definitely one of their more polished 80s albums yeah. but yeah. yeah works for me and rhythm of love i mean that was a pretty big single for them it was yeah definitely the biggest yeah. single off off of this album here and and just that chugging driving uh you know progression yeah. on it yeah. how, how can you know I agree with you. I think that that is probably their most polished, like 80s sounding album, but it's, it's really good. I mean, I, I looked at that one as possibly choosing. Right. But I did not. And which did you choose? <laughs> I went with uh, 1982's Blackout. Yep. That was um, going to be my second choice. You know, and I, I like you, uh, put this on the other day because I wanted to reacquaint myself with this album. Mm -hmm. And I was writing down in my notes after almost every song, riff, riff, riff. Like this album has some heavy freaking riffs. Like just, they're like metal riffs in this album. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, um, you know, it's got the hit, um, No One Like You. Oh, that one is a perfect one. Yeah, but I mean. You know from that, down in Brazil. <laughs> yeah exactly but i mean there's the one week track on here is this, this is the song arizona mm -hmm. it's talking about like some tour escapades that they were doing but it sort of sounds like one of these tracks where they're like all right we need another song for the album sort of thing mm -hmm. but other than that everything and I, they take some chances on here as well there's a song called china white which is yeah. this slow brooding song and it's almost uh got a priest quality to it so um it's funny though, because like the album you showed, I feel like that was commercial. This was commercial too, but I feel like this album was like really heavy. Like it shows their heavy metal roots as well. Um, and then the last song is a ballad when the smoke, um, my eyes are getting old, when the smoke is going down. Right. And what I like about this is it's sort of like a precursor to the ballads that you talked about. And also like what we would get to with Winds of Change, which was a right. huge hit for them. So yeah, I, I had to go with this album. I just, I love the heaviness of it. Like I said, it's like riff after riff after riff. Uh, another little known fact, do you pronounce his name Klaus? His Klaus, name? Klaus Mein. Klaus Mein. I guess he was going through vocal surgery at the time of this album. So they, they did some demos with Don Dockin. Yeah. And uh, I guess they obviously weren't used for the album, but I guess Don Dockin sings background on some of these yeah. tracks so apparently he sang five songs because had klaus not made it through the vocal surgery and come back don was right. going to sing for them right and they rehearsed for six months with him and played and recorded and klaus was yeah. there the whole time recovering so right. it was fully on the up and up but uh yeah and what, what year was that album was that uh, uh 1982 yes right so that tied into Doc and getting their album deal. They got a German, oh, okay. a German label deal out of it because Don didn't get uh, the gig doing that. So he reformed Doc right. and this time forming it with George Lynch, who was not in the original lineup of it. And he got a German uh, record deal out of it. The Scorpions helped hook him up with that. And I will say this, Scorpions covers got better in the eighties. Uh, oh. And I'm only gonna say Virgin Killer 70. Oh. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. 
but yeah, they got a little bit more tasteful. Right. So yeah, even if, as for the, those of you that don't know that album as. cover, uh, Google it if you can find yeah. the original cover of it. But I don't know uh, how they got away with those things back then. <laughs> no, and it's like, seriously, why would you want that on the front cover of your album? But whatever, you know. Th things were different. Things were different back in the 70s. The, the, those kind of laws didn't exist at that time. So, yeah. But yeah, but, uh, that's, that's a whole I mean, both of the that. albums we showed, like t this whole dis this whole discussion tonight, like mm -hmm. seriously, you could put, you could throw Savage Amusement and Blackout up in the air oh. and when one lands, they're both killers. So, absolutely. I mean, you, out of the four albums that are available from the 80s from them, um, I'm totally spacing on it. Uh, it's, it's the first album of, of the 80s uh, where the uh, woman's uh, kneeling down in front of the, the dog. Oh, yeah, dog. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the oh, opening, animal, mag animal magnetism. Uh, animal magnetism. That was another one that I was heavily debating. Uh, the opening track, Make It Real. That's one start to finish on that one. The Zoo comes the all zoo the way is good. Through, and it just really- There were just a couple, there were a couple weak tracks on that album though. Yeah, I, can't. I don't know. I always like that. I go to that album a lot and, and this yeah. one. Uh, yeah yeah no no you're it's, right any, any both... given day of the week I, I could be saying something different here yeah exactly all right so next up we've got uh the bad boys of rock motley crew okay and uh who went i went first on last one you go on this one all right so this will always be my favorite motley crew album i have never changed i've never wavered mm -hmm. i will go toe to toe with somebody um gotta go with too fast for love interesting this right. is my favorite motley crew album i love it's raw yeah. it's punk it's like in it's your easy. It's, yeah it you can just smell the youth on this album <laughs> i mean you know dude seriously they open with live wire mm -hmm. uh you've got piece of your action on here starry eyes which is yeah. underrated too fast for love that riff will just stay with you merry-go-round is a fantastic merry-go-round come and dance i i just like the you know tommy lee was doing cowbell on here yeah i mean it was just i mean and look at that cover i mean oh i know i mean how how great is that like if i could fit into those pants in the 80s i would be like rocking but i mean motley crew too fast for love 1982 if you didn't have this album you were not cool yeah and I mean, okay, so listen, Shout at the Devil kicks ass as well. Yep. Um, Theater of Pain, they're, I mean, okay, Theater of Pain, I like it, but there are some weak tracks. I gotta go with Too Fast for Love, though. This will always be my favorite Motley Crue album. It's not as heavy as Shout at the Devil, it's a little right. bit more glammy, but yeah, maybe it's, it's more it. punk. It's, it's definitely yeah. punk, definitely of the era of 1981 you know not metal not having really broken through at that point yeah and you can tell by the shirt i'm wearing here i'm a huge motley crew fan so i could yeah. have picked any of their albums uh you know from throughout the 80s and i could easily have gone with their first one there um, and you know what's funny is here's the inner picture of them you know they're all being satanic and hi we're, we're kind of like slayer but the music doesn't match that it's weird it's almost like Shout, this would have been a better inner for Shout of the Devil. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I noticed that too. I mean, I got into them, um, you know, 88, 89 kind of time frame. So I went backwards on them kind of a thing and already knew what they were sounding like on the Girls, Girls, Girls and Dr. Feelgood and stuff like that by the yeah. time I was listening to it. So seeing those, you know, satanic pictures or whatever kind of a thing didn't phase me because I already knew what the sound was but I can't imagine like looking at that and not knowing what what they sounded like and then putting it on and hearing the rawness you know the, the punk quality that was uh Too Fast for Love and that song Too Fast for Love has got to be in my opinion their best song ever the guitar yeah. riff opening on that is just phenomenal and uh you know Vince Neil say what you want about him but that guy i watched the um the netflix show on motley crew or whatever I yeah, the dirt. What yeah i mean i know that they had some guy playing vince neal but you know vince neal he had the look yep he had i mean his voice was perfect it was this sleazy quality and it just matched the music um 
And again, I mean, it, in other albums, he did the same as well. But for some reason, everything just comes together for me on this album. Um, with Shout at the Devil being a close second for me. So Yeah, I, I almost went uh, with Shout at the Devil on it. But for me, I had to go Dr. Feel Good. And I know this one is is the obvious choice. I think uh, we would expect that from uh, most people in terms of Motley Crue. But and that was produced by Bob Rock, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, produced for for them first before going on and making uh, a, Metallica, you know, an even bigger name. Yeah, with Metallica, yeah. Uh, Motley Crue always joked that they stole uh, Bob Rock from them, kind of thing. Um, but uh, no, this album here, um, again, you know, a, a lot of a lot of what I'm talking about tonight, you know, for me are albums that start to finish. There's not one bad song on it. Uh, but this one here had a little bit of everything on it. It had really, you know, like Dr. Feelgood, the opening riff on that is just so heavy. Great song, great song. Um, the way they recorded those drums and the bass on that is just yeah. amazing. I mean, it's few bands have been able to capture a sound like that on an album. But then to go from that into the next song on here, um, which is uh, Slice of Your Pie, you know, it starts off, it's it's sleazy, it's dirty, it's, you know, kind of winding up and it really kicks in from there. And you go through that, but then you've got, you know, Kickstart My Heart, you know, it's almost a thrash pace yeah. piece that's on it. You've got the power ballads with, uh, um, you know, Without You and Great song. Time for Change that's at the end on this one here. Uh, my favorite track on here, though, is She Goes Down. And yeah. it's just, I don't know, that was a song that was just fun and, uh, you know, exciting and over the top kind of a thing. Never made it as a single. I always thought it would have been a great, fantastic single for them. But yeah. five singles came off of this album. I mean, this thing had legs for days and just yeah. kept going. Uh, a lot of bands, you know, would try to continue to push another single, push another single kind of a thing. But each one they put out, they just kept having hits with them. Yeah. No, and I agree. I mean, I mean, you know, Bob Rock, the production of it is is great. The songwriting is great. And wasn't, I mean, by this point, Motley Crue was was clean, right? Yeah, it's, that that was another point I was gonna, the drugs and I yeah. was gonna make about uh both uh you know Aerosmith and and Motley Crue for that matter. You know, I mean they had cleaned up bought for done done with mirrors. Yeah. But I don't think that that cleaning up and uh, being coming that band unit again really did it for them until Permanent Vacation. But yeah. this was Motley Crue's first album after getting clean. And I yeah. think it really shows. I mean, it just everything lined up for them. But equally, I think that's what broke them up two years later, 1991-92 era, when Vince was out of the band is when they didn't have the drugs and the alcohol and everything to mask however they were feeling about one another and everything was crystal right. clear and you had to finally put up with someone's shenanigans that maybe you didn't care about yeah. before so it's like we got this phenomenal record out of it but i also think it's it's what led to the breakup so motley crew is one of those crazy bands though because like if you think about it each album was different like to too fast for love was their glam punk album mm -hmm. and then out of the devil was like okay everybody's throwing uh you know satanic stuff around so we're gonna do a satanic album yeah, that's the full-on metal one for them yeah, and then Theater of Pain was like, okay, we want to be like Poison, so we're right. going to put makeup on and do Home Sweet Home, which I love. I love that song. Oh, yeah. Um, and then Girls, Girls, Girls was sort of their, like, street look album. Right. And then, uh, you know, Dr. Feelgood was the the pinnacle. Like, that That was where, that was as good as Motley Crue could get. That's right. No, I agree. And it, it interesting, I mean, like, you point out uh, Poison when you reference uh, Theater of Pain, but that actually came out in 1985 before Poison, right? And oh, okay, you, so Motley Crue influenced Poison then. That's right. Uh, okay. And if you look at all of these things um, and the bands that came after them, Motley Crue was always on the upward trajectory, doing something first, changing their look. I mean, one of the things I always liked about them is the logo changed for every album. And it was unheard of at the time because the logo was your look. It was your identity back then. I mean, right. this was before internet and everything so people relied on uh name recognition and appearance recognition and things like that but motley crew changed for every album they changed their sound they changed their look changed their logo kind of a thing now, now did they did they lose the umlauts on top of the o and the u on nope. that one? no no that's on on every one i don't know if we can all right so they kept that then but they just yeah. changed the font right yeah no they keep the umlauts on every yeah. 
release, every uh, name, but they definitely changed how it was done kind of a thing. And, and you're right. That's a huge deal. Cause I remember, I know we're not talking about Metallica, but I remember when the black album came out, Metallica mm -hmm. lost their emblem, you know, their yes. how it looked on each side. And yeah. as a kid, we were like, what are you doing Metallica? Like you, you know, and it was like, but you're right. That's the logo is a big thing. And so for someone like Metallica who had kept it for the four previous albums, right yeah. to do it all of a sudden that was a big jarring thing and of course they do it right. again when it went to load and reload but motley right. Crue had been changing it on every single release kind of a thing right. so it was i don't know for me at least by the time it was you know these albums were rolling around it was like oh what's their next logo going to be i can't wait it was just part of the the newness of getting a new album what's the new look what's the new uh logo but you're right dr feelgood was it or decade of decadence and the three tracks that they did like primal scream yeah. But after that, uh, they started playing, chasing the trend, yeah. you know, yeah. putting in the sampled beats and the things like that and the generation swine and. Right. Yeah. Dr. Feelgood was, I mean, that's as good as Motley Crue could be. Right. Right. Um, but that, that was interesting that you brought up the, the name, the font of the name though, because I had never really thought about that before. Yeah. Yeah. Go back and, and right. check out each one of their album covers and it's different on every single one. Yeah. All right, uh, next up, uh, Godfather of Shock Rock, Alice Cooper. And uh, for me, uh, choice was Trash, 1989. That's when just came in under the wire. And um, I don't know, maybe this is one that most people will choose or maybe it's not. I mean, for me, uh, it's all about uh, the songwriting in Desmond Child who also produced it. Now, Alice Cooper changes. Uh, he's another one. He's a chameleon. He changes yeah. almost every single album. Now he's been around for so long, he's reverting back and hitting some old stuff. But throughout the 70s and the 80s, he constantly changed. And this one here was just another one of that. But when he brought in Desmond Child for the songwriting, it, it softened the edges of him and really polished it up. And I guess that's what I like about it. It's uh, the songwriting's over the top. So you get that um the spirit of alice cooper and and the sound and and the vocal stylings of all of that but it's as clean and it's as polished as it's ever going to get kind of a thing it's it um you know he's got other things that you can get that rough and ready uh sound that detroit sound you know the more punk sound kind of a thing um and of course he did the new wave period in the early 80s and stuff like that but for me this one it was this one here and of course i have to say though a lot of it is is owed to uh desmond child and then also the guests that were on the album i mean he has um you know guys from winger bon jovi he's got the guys from aerosmith on there um and their vocals are pretty prominent on some of these tracks you can really hear steven tyler singing on it so for me like listening to this album it was just like a really cool uh, culmination of everything where it brought this great guy from the 70s and early 80s into what was going on at the time. Um, and isn't uh, Poison's on that? Yeah, right? Poison, Spark in the Dark, and House of Fire. Uh, those three tracks, you know, one, two, three off there, just really big. The song Poison and House of Fire were uh, the singles and videos off of it. But there's a lot of great st uh, stuff, deep cuts on he here. Uh, Hell is Living Without You is an, a really great one. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with that, definitely check that out. But my all-time favorite track on here is Bed of Nails. Really, yeah. really great track. Well, it's funny when you look up Alice Cooper on Spotify, the first song that comes up is Poison. So Yeah, uh, well, I mean, it was a, a, a number 10, uh, you know, single for him. And it was his first one since 1977. You know, okay. first top 10 for him, you know. So um, I think a lot of people, and it definitely reintroduced him to a lot of people. I mean, I didn't know 70s Alice Cooper when this album yeah. came out. It, it was news to me kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, so this this was you know this was my Alice Cooper and not uh, you know maybe my older brother's Alice Cooper kind of a thing you know where right. they were into the stuff from him from the 70s and knowing him from that uh, vintage uh, I heard this and it was like wow what is this who is this you right know? right and Desmond Child I mean you wanted him writing for you I know he wrote for Kiss as well yep um, so uh, yeah he Whatever. was did he write um the big aerosmith uh he wrote song. some aerosmith he wrote for um rat he, he yeah. was all over detonator he produced that oh yeah, yeah yeah yep i mean a lot of people don't don't didn't know this um 
he would record and, and produce under a pseudonym, Sir Arthur Payson, which is just his, his name, Desmond Child, rearranged. Oh, okay. So yeah. if you ever see like Rat, Detonator is produced by Sir Arthur Payson. Oh, but that's Desmond that. Child. Okay. So when, and I don't really know why, I don't know if he was trying like, okay, Rat didn't want to be associated with Desmond Child, but they wanted to work with them. Mm -hmm. kind of a thing or whether it was legal things um because i noticed on this album here um it's produced by desmond child but it's recorded by sir arthur payson and i have to wonder if that doesn't go back to um like maybe being some royalty royalty issues. right yeah. if he did it under one name he wasn't going to make as much as if it was looked like they hired two separate people right you know because I've heard that in terms of session players, session players would would do that sort of a thing. They would get paid by the number of notes. So if they played on a song and they play a descending bass line or something on it, yeah. if they, you know, some of these session guys would talk about, well, they would come back and they would say, well, they would want to double it up or play over the top of it. So they would change it a little bit. So it was an entirely new piece. And then right. they were being paid twice as opposed to once for something. That's it makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, I was <laughs> I was gonna pick this. Okay. <laughs> like, and this would have been like total like, Chris, why are you picking this album? But <laughs> this is starting to become one of my favorite Alice Cooper albums. I love the new wave sound of it. I love yeah. the chances he took with it. We're we're all clones. It's a great song. Yeah, and you know. He lost a lot of people in this period, but I think you all should go back and rediscover this album and the ones that followed, like, um, I can't even, oh, Zipper Catches Skin. Zipper Catches Skin is a great album, in my opinion. I like yeah, that even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dada's got, yeah, that's a little strange, but yeah, I agree with you. But I'm not going with that one. Okay. But before before we pass, pass on that one, um, yeah. uh, the song, uh, We're All Clones. So yeah. Smashing Pumpkins did a great cover of that song. So, oh, really? Yeah, it's, uh, they did it around the same time as uh, Pisces I Carry It. So okay. uh, it's on the box set from that time period. An aeroplane flies high, gathered it up. Yeah. yeah. I, lo I love Smashing Pumpkins. So, yeah. I would do so if you're a fan of Smashing Pumpkins, you know, Billy Corgan's a fan of, of 80s Alice Cooper flush the fashion. Towards and here's what I'm going to say. I know we're not talking about Smashing Pumpkins, but Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, that is the white album of the 90s. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, All that's right, so Flush the Fashion, I was going to pick this, and I, I felt like people would hate me, so I'm not picking that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the one I went with is one that I had on cassette, uh, 1987's Raise Your Fist and Yell. That's a, that's a good one. I do like that one. So here's the thing. I mean, as we talked about, Alice Cooper sort of lost his direction. He, I, you know, he was on, he was probably on every drug known to man. He didn't know. I don't think he remembered the recording of, uh, you know, Flush the Fashion. He claims to have never taken any drugs. He, he was, huh, a, okay. he was a I don't drinker. believe it. Heavy, heavy drinker. All right. So drinker. So he was right. drinking probably everything known to man. Yeah. Excessive drinking. Right. So he sort of lost his way. And then I think Constrictor came out before this, I want to say. Yes. So then he found this metal sound again. He lost it for a while. Right. And then, you know, metal, of course, was huge. Uh, Constrictor came out sort of like, uh, a, again, a reinvention of Alice Cooper. And then you had this album, which is even building on that more. I remember having this on a cassette as a kid. I just always loved that cover. I think probably because it freaked my parents out. <laughs> but, you know, looking at some history of this, Kip Winger plays bass on this album. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I don't know this guy, Kane Roberts on guitar. He is just ripping solos on this Have album. Have you never heard the Kane Roberts solo album? No. Oh, my God. He put out an album in 1990. And if you like, well, if you like this album, if you like Trash, yeah. then yeah. Desmond Child co-wrote and, and I don't know if he produced but he definitely co-wrote with Kane Roberts and it's okay. like part B of, of this record here but that amazing guitar playing is on that date it's, and it's actually it's his second solo album okay. I forget the name of it, it um, oh man totally spacing on it now but it is his second solo album he's actually got 
at the, in the eighties, he did one at the same time as that album there, like yeah. 88 or, or um, maybe it was 87, but it's, and it's got them all muscle and ripped and he's got his machine gun guitar. Yeah. But I don't know that album never clicked with me. I've never liked it, but the follow-up album number two, amazing, highly recommended. Well, when I was listening to this album again the other day, I'm like, who is this guy just ripping it on the guitar? Kane Roberts, I looked him up. I didn't see him associated really with any other bands. I know he played on other albums. Right. But he, yeah, he, he been in a, he's in a, in a band. Like, yeah. I, if I had a band in the 80s, I would have hired Kane Roberts. I mean, have you that, seen the photos of him? He got hired because he was a bodybuilder and he played oh, really? guitar. And he, okay. he, today, I think he looks comical. Okay. Um, in terms of the appearance, this big bodybuilder looking guy with huge muscles and a guitar that looks like a machine gun. Okay. But in the 80s, you know, that it was a gimmick and it was part of his stage show. Right. Oh, that's awesome. I'm going to have to look into that. You know, one thing I like about this album, it is really heavy. The first song, Freedom, I wrote down speed metal. It's very it's almost speed metal like it's very mm -hmm. anthemic. Um, you've got the song Prince of Darkness, which was, uh, you know, using the John Carpenter film. I love Chop, Chop, Chop. It's just like classic Alice Cooper. Mm -hmm. um, Gail sort of harkens back to the sort of the shock rock era of Aerosmith, of, Aerosmith, of Alice Cooper in the 70s. I think uh, Kip is playing uh, keyboards on that song. Mm -hmm. And then it ends with like one of the best songs, Roses on White Lace. Oh, I love that song. Yeah. yeah. And has another speed metal riff. So this is sort of like, I don't know, I'm, I'm sensing a theme with myself here that I sort of like these raw albums. Like this is raw Alice Cooper. I mean, it's heavy, it's raw. Um, is it like the big seller? No, but it's sort of got that raw quality to it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just have always sort of, uh, had a connection to it yeah so for me you know i thought about those two albums those two metal albums there and his mid period but i i felt a little bit like he was chasing the trend with it because metal was popular not not that he wasn't with this one i just felt like this one here achieved better than most bands that were doing it so even though he did go to doing the more hair band style of music yeah. and it was chasing a trend I think he just achieved it so much more successfully than those uh, two more metal albums. But I love and it. And that album that you chose is a more mature album. It's better produced. The songwriting's there. We're bringing Desmond Child in. Right. right. They catered, they get, got Alice's look just right. Like it was very commercial. Yeah. And, uh, but it made a killer record. Oh, absolutely. So. I mean, people are going to remember your record more than they're going to remember this. <laughs> but there's, I really like this album a lot. There's diehards out there. I mean, there's plenty of people that hate this record that just think it was uh, too commercial kind yeah. of a thing. So we uh, should do a video, though, on the three new wave albums that or three or four new wave albums that Alice did. Yeah, we'll, we'll need to do a separate video and cover uh, some of the different periods within Alice because there's a lot of great ones and even oh, yeah, though they're definitely. all different styles alice just he, he was great with them all yep i'm a huge fan of his so all right uh we're down to the top five uh or the the last five i should say so uh doing 10 of these here and uh, next up we got uh deep purple offshoot band white snake and uh who's going i think i'm starting this one you're starting this yeah. one all right this was so easy. I, I have to go with this album. Yeah, I, mean, I got it here in my background, which means I'm not going with it, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, okay, do I go with the obvious choice? Yes, I go with the obvious choice. This has my favorite White Snake song, Still of the Night. Mm -hmm. I, you can't touch that song. That song is amazing. Um, you know, I like the updated versions of Here I Go Again. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what was the other one? Crying in the Rain. Isn't Crying in the Rain an updated yeah, Crying one? in the Rain, yeah. That's a re-recording um, from Saints and Sinners, I think. Both of those. Is this White Snake for the 80s? Yes, it is. Do a lot of people have a problem because they lost their bluesy sound? Okay, yeah, but this album is killer. And oh, David yeah. at the point, he was an older gentleman. Mm-hmm. But uh, 
he still had a way with the ladies. He could still present himself in a, I'm going to use the term sexy, but mm-hmm. he could present himself in a sexy way on video. He was perfect for videos. Yeah. And had his girlfriend, what was her name? Uh, 20 Katane. She was dancing all over the cars. And yeah. I mean, it was like, it was everything as a kid that I wanted. Right, right. I mean, he, he was a sex symbol. Even yeah, and you know, it was, yeah. and the songs match it. I mean, David Coverdale's vocals on here are amazing. Yeah. Well, um, John Sykes' right. guitar playing on there is par none. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. You can't go wrong with that. But yeah, White Snakes definitely split their period pre '84 and slide it in because there's a mix of slide it in that's the more bluesy rock that has. Um, uh, Bernie Marsden and uh, Mickey Moody on it before Bernie Marsden was replaced by John Sykes and it became right. that more commercialized sound and it's it's right there 83 84 that they shift um, and there's you know a lot of the 70s fans don't like or you know early 80s fans don't like the later period um, and vice versa kind of a thing but um, I don't know I mean to me it's just an evolution uh, it's, and I like the album that followed this as well. Well, uh, that'll that'll lead into there. Right, there we go. <laughs> where I'm going with it, and and I seriously did consider going with the 1987 or self-titled album. Yeah, I mean, it just has the big hits, and it's it's you know it's classic, and that was the first album that I got by them. It's the 1987 yeah. one, kind of a thing. But uh, I ended up going going with this one, uh, "Slip of the Tongue" from '89. Most because of Steve Vaught, who's yeah. on it. Um, now, you know, I always looked at this album too, like this, this you know, White Snake was, um, you know, a super group before super groups really existed. I mean, there were some in the 80s that got put together and stuff. I mean, certainly people talked about like the Honey Drippers as being a super group kind of a thing because right. Page and Plant repaired up on it and stuff. Well, like David, that. David Lee Roth's band, Freedom and Smile, would have kind of been a super group. Right. Band. Except that um, Steve I was not yet known. He came from Frank Zappa. So looking okay. back at it, you're absolutely right with Billy Sheehan, who goes on to Mr. Big, right. um, Greg Bissonette on drums, who's played with everybody. It's like a super group now. Right. But I mean, at the time, uh, with this, Steve Vai had made a name with David Lee Roth, right? David Coverdale, already from Deep Purple and doing White Snake in there on vocals. You got Rudy Sarzo from Quiet Riot fame already in there. And he had already played with some other people too post uh, leaving Quiet Riot. Tommy Aldridge on drums. Right. And then Adrian Vandenberg from Vandenberg. Now, Adrian doesn't play on the album. He wrote the album, he got an injury. And so Steve Vai actually plays all the guitar on it. But Adrian Vandenberg wrote the record with David Coverdale. Steve okay. Vai, I don't know, he, he may have contributed here or there, but ultimately d- didn't write the album. But of course his signature guitar playing is all over it. But it's like, when you look at that lineup of Steve Vai, Adrian Vandenberg, David Coverdale, Rudy Sarzo, and uh, Tommy Aldridge, it's like, yeah. At, even at that time, it was like the who's who of a lineup kind of a thing. So when this album came out, and I already knew, we already knew it wasn't going to be the same as the 1987 because John Sykes left before going on tour and he right. hires Vivian Campbell, who came from Dio. So right. a little bit, you know, n- well known there, but and prior to him doing Def Leppard, but it was like Vivian Campbell didn't stick around to make the new record kind of a thing. So yeah, I, I just, you know, I ended up going with this, and after our discussion yesterday and talking about uh, songs that were re-recorded, Full for Your Lovin' is on. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Coming off of 1980's Ready and Willing, and I seriously, that was going to be my other choice. I really considered going with Ready and Willing. Um, That one is, to me, the culmination of that bluesier period, Uh, and just a great album start to finish, but ultimately went with this one and for the, the reason also I think Full for Your Lovin' is done better here on yeah. this. I do like the original but it's just so much better on this so yeah I had to go with this album. Yeah I like the re-recordings of the songs that they did in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah um, but that that album that you showed it was the perfect way to follow this album it did yeah totally built on that 
Yeah, it's like White Snake said, oh, okay, we've got a lot of people who are interested in us now. Like, we're going to follow with the sort of the same pattern, but that album's even even a little bit more polished in that, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like, I mean, these are definitely sister records. I mean, they're mm -hmm. very similar, even though they have different, you know, members. Um, yeah, more so than sliding. It could have been a double album. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, these two definitely go hand in hand, more so than, than say, Slide It In in 1987. Yeah. Well, Slide It In is still holding on to that blues. Right, right. I mean, this was like, you know what? We're going to throw the blues out the window. Yeah, we're and going hard rock. And on, we're jumping on tapping the guitar. We're jumping on the whole look and everything. So Right, and totally it, modernization for these two records. Yeah. Definitely a reinvention for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really, I could have gone with a number of their albums. I could have gone with Slide It In. I mean, that's- What that were the singles off of that album, that uh, Slip of the Tongue? Yeah, so this one had, of course, Fool for Your Lovin' on it, yeah. uh, The Deeper the Love. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Huge power ballad. Which, which was, is this love part two. Right, right. And Now You're Gone. Okay. Another one, you know, starts really slow and then kicks in on it. Isn't I, there a song about like a cat scratching on there or something? Yeah, like Kitten's Got Claws. Kitten's well, got it wasn't claws a though. single in video, but yeah, that's on here. Uh, Cheap and Nasty is just another great tune. David Coverdale. Oh my God, that guy. Well, even some of the, the latest uh, White Snake albums are, yeah. I, you know, he's lost a little bit, but he can still pull it off. I mean, the guy is like ageless. I agree. I mean, he, he looks amazing uh, despite his, him, him aging and, and over the years. Yeah. I think he still sounds great. And now I've heard, read some recent things that apparently he's not sounding as great in concert. So okay. I, it maybe is finally catching up live with them. It's probably been five years since I, I've seen them live. I saw them do uh, the tour for the Purple album where he yep. did the reinterpretation of all the Deep Purple songs. And I thought he sounded great. I, I yeah. didn't think he was missing a step there in that. But in, in the last couple of years, I've read some negative reviews. So I don't know. Uh, fortunately, he can still do, uh, you know, take his time and do the vocals in the studios. And he's sounding amazing on that sort of stuff. And, you know, it, 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 to me, it's okay. You know, I go into these concerts knowing that David Coverdale is up there. I don't know if he's in late 60s or he's actually peaked and hit 70, but, yeah, you know, if you're going to go see a concert and the guy is 68 plus years old, you know, it's like you have to give them a break and say, like, obviously the vocals are not going to be as good as they were in the 70s or right. the 80s. Right. Right. And if you're not willing to accept that, if you think you're going to go see this guy live and he's still going to sound like that, then what are yeah. you doing? kind of a yeah, thing. No. I'm, I don't know. I'm on it for the ride with, with the band, with the, the members. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, they're going to age. They're going to sound different. They're not going to be able to hit the high notes. It's like Don Dockin. Don yeah. Dockin can't hit the high notes anymore. And a lot of people complain about it, but I still, I love his songwriting. I love, you know, the present, the, the lyrics that he does, the way that he sings without yeah. hitting the high notes. Yeah. Okay. I'll take an album of his without hitting all those high notes. I'm okay yeah. with it. Yeah. And you got to look at the history of David Coverdale. I mean, Jesus, he sang with Deep Purple on Burn. I mean, that <laughs> album is killer. Come Taste the Band. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, he got he has some solo records that were great, too. Mm -hmm. And White Snake. I mean, that was what was cool about a lot of the 70s singers. Like, even thinking about Dio, like, he sang with Elf. Yeah. And he did Rainbow. And and Sabbath, and yeah, Sabbath. And I mean, these guys went from band to band and they like reinvented the bands. And I don't know, it was such a cool time for music. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely a different era in time where you weren't pigeonholed with one particular thing. And I think that has a, also has a lot to do with the fact of uh, the limited media at the time. Yeah. Um, MTV killed a lot of that because it put the face to the name with a lot right. of them. And then you changed a band member and suddenly people were like, oh, it, it, it can't sound or it isn't going to be what it once right. was. But in the 70s, you, they changed members all the time and it wasn't a big deal. But that's because most people didn't know what the guys looked like and didn't, uh, you know, yeah. there wasn't MTV and things like that. And uh, I think that's why like Rainbow had, what, four different vocalists? And yeah. were successful in all of the lineups. Yeah, um, you couldn't do that today. 
you know. Um, I was reading I something where um, when David Coverdale first came into White Snake, I don't think he came from, I think he was sort of just singing with like local bands, I want to say. Yeah, he was an unknown. He sent him a cassette. And when he first came in, he was a little chubby and overweight. Uh -huh. and, and they said, you got to lose some weight or whatever. And so he would, he just did, he didn't have, it was sort of a strain. They must have heard his voice because right. obviously I don't think they were going with a look. And I don't think he probably presented himself in the way he does now. Mm -hmm. So they must have just heard the magic of his voice. And then they sort of like tailored his look along the way. Yep. And then he came into his own. Right, right. You're probably right. Um, I mean, I have heard those stories and seen those early uh, photo shoots of him and he is a little chubbier in those kind of a thing. And then uh, over the course of the Burn tour, uh, oh, yeah. really, you know, chiseled and, and everything. But um, yeah, I know I, I do remember uh, hearing him say, you know, he was unsure of himself and stuff like that. But obviously they heard the powerhouse vocals in him. And oh, yeah. what always amazed me, though, is that they bring in uh, Glenn Hughes on bass, who's a phenomenal yeah. vocalist in his own right. Why then did they choose to go with David Coverdale, who's another phenomenal vocalist? But I think they should have just gone with Glenn Hughes, kind of a thing. So they must have really heard what you know David was singing and doing and liked that and wanted to put that forward. And, and it obviously it was a very different style of vocals than Ian Gillen. And Deep Purple changed because uh, this is suddenly becoming a Deep Purple video. But right, I know. <laughs> when Glenn Hughes came in, they changed their style. It was more like R&B. They had an R&B influence in some of their stuff. It's true. I mean, Stormbringer. Uh, became yeah, Stormbringer. Very, yeah, Glenn Hughes definitely took them in what uh, Richie Blackmore has always described as their funky phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. R&B funky, yeah. Yeah, and, and outside of Stormbringer, the, the song, the lead song on that, I don't really care for that album because it gets too funky. But I think that Come Taste the Band is where it really came together when Tommy Boland came in on guitar. Yep. And Glenn Hughes and Tommy Boland together were a perfect match where it stayed rocking and it didn't become too funky, but they were able to bring those elements into it. That album of those three is my favorite, Come Taste the Band. The title track, Stormbringer, though, is amazing. Ah, it's it's par none. It's 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 excellent. All right, so we got to do a Deep Purple video now. Yeah, I know, right? And so many different members, uh, yeah. players in that lineup. I know, we're going to have to go through and talk about who's the, what was the best lineup? What was the best yeah. album? Yeah, Definitely. that'll be an interesting one. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Blues Rockers, Great White. So, uh, am I am I up? I think so. I, I, I keep losing track of who does who okay, goes. Yeah. To you know, I have a couple of their early albums um, on vinyl. I, I should have pulled them out. I know. I'm, I'm thinking about this too. I'm like, I wish I had the full catalogs of these artists because we keep going into these uh, separate things that I want to. Let me just up. see if I can pull it out here. Let's. Uh, sure. So you want to share right now? Or? Yeah, why don't I share then? So I ended up choosing uh, Twice Shy. Yeah. And uh, again, probably an obvious choice. And, and I did debate. I really like their debut, uh, Stick It. And I almost went with that. But I, I and then debated between the Once Bitten, which is the sort of part one, if you will, because both of those albums really go hand in hand. They apparently were not recorded in that regard. It was something that the style of it was very similar. And so they ended up doing matching album covers and artwork, uh, the way that they did all the song titles just running together and stuff like that that made them feel like a part one and part two but uh, they weren't actually recorded or written together or anything but going back and listening to these um this album here just it had the hits and i didn't know this at, uh, until i was looking it up yesterday but it actually sold two million copies at the time so it was their most successful album and of course it's got the big hit that everybody knows uh once bitten twice shy which goes in or ties in with the title on here kind right. of thing that was an ian hunter song a re-recording and i didn't know about ian hunter or mop the hoople at the time so for me that was new hearing it but it was the other tracks that came off of it uh mr bone just such a the, the groove of that bass line that comes in on it. it's like uh, van halen's running with the devil you know yeah. where it's such a signature bass line on it that opens it up kind of thing um just down and dirty but then angel song uh ballad on it and house of broken love which is a really bluesy a play between being a blues rock song 
and a ballad. And uh, House of Broken Love, it's got like a two and a half minute intro on it before the vocals come in. And it was one of those things that's like, whatever they were doing on it, it wasn't like they were doing anything crazy guitar soloing wise or anything. It just held my interest on it to the point that I didn't even realize two and a half minutes had gone by without regular vocals and typical song structure coming to play on it. But I just felt that uh, with this album here, the, the deep cuts and those four single cuts on it, it, it just reached a benchmark for them and ended up being the album I, I decided to go with on it. And you couldn't go anywhere without hearing Once Bitten, Twice Shy. Yeah, I know. 1988, that was just everywhere. And the music video, too, on it. And, uh, and really, I mean, it's a simple song. It just hit a chord with people, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know. I, at following this album here, I started really paying attention to other uh, Ian Hunter and Mott the Hoople songs that people were covering, right. uh, taking note to that and realizing, wait, who is this other artist? You know, who is this person that's been writing these for these great blues rockers and stuff? Right, right. Well, uh, I mean, I love Twice Shy. I didn't choose that one, but I just want to show off these two albums because I got into Great White with uh, the album Once Bitten and also the album Twice Shy. And then in the last couple of years, I didn't realize they had these albums. This is their debut, I want to say, just called Great White. Yeah, well, is that one there um, five tracks only or uh, ten? This one has... Because they, it's also out under the name Stick It. That's why I referred to that. This one has 10 different tracks on it. It does. Okay. So the, the one that, that I've got, which is called Stick It. Yeah. And uh, since I got my great white, you're behind me on the wall. So I don't okay, know. Yeah. This is, I, I just, well, yours that's is, the same back cover. Yeah. Yours is probably the original album cover to it. I, or, you know, and yeah, uh, I think this is, original. I don't know, but I yeah. know it is Stick It. Uh, but my point is I, I've, just discovered this album and i also just discovered shot in the dark yeah is another great record the thing with these two records were great white was still trying to find their sound like i hear a lot of rat in shot in the dark and shot in the dark was more metal i mean just look at the picture of uh jack russell holding the gun (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah like look at that they're I'm like, like what is he trying to do with that but you know he's a convicted felon right went to jail okay, so so it fit then yes it fit yeah. they were probably so my point is is like these albums are i love those those albums but they hadn't found their sound yet mm-hmm. so i'm going with one spitting okay as my top 80s um i mean again they're sister albums one spitting and twice shy right. i like the cover of twice shy better but um i mean You've got Lady Red Light on here, Rock Me, which is a huge song, All Over Now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, Save Your Love, which is a great ballad. Oh, yeah. Um, How's the yeah, bro- Broken I, Love and that song together you can't beat? And I, Jack Russell, I mean, I know you've probably heard him sing Led Zeppelin songs. Yes. but And I know most people yeah. probably watch your channel have heard him do Zeppelin, but he does an amazing Zeppelin, or uh, Robert Plant. Yeah, I mean, easily, he could have done the Page Plant, or sorry, not Page Plant, the Coverdale Page album, yeah. could have been David Coverdale, which is a phenomenal record, another one, Right. Um, could have easily been Jack Russell and right. uh, Jimmy Page together. Um, they did uh, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You uh, yeah. for MTV Unplugged that became a hit for them, and the radio started playing it. Even though there was no album, there was nothing to go on it, but it just started to really, uh, people started really to take note of it and started to see the comparison in it. And I've always, you know, and uh, Great White did an album called Great Zeppelin. It's all Led Zeppelin uh, cover songs. And they're Jack Russell's version of Great White now is actually doing Great Zeppelin Part Two. Okay. Whole record of, Led Zeppelin tunes that are not from that album. I don't know if he's doing, I think he's doing it in the studio, not not live where uh, the Great White version of it was a live from a concert. Okay. And I think what's interesting about Great White too is that unlike the other bands, it almost seemed like the other bands needed to get more glammy and more makeup and outfits and stuff to become popular. Great White went the reverse. Like their first two albums- Were more metal. We're chasing the trends here. Yep. 
And then when they started to strip down their sound, get a little bit more bluesy, kind of just become more natural, that's when they became big. And yeah. I think what was cool about Great White is they channeled that 70s vibe, mm-hmm. the Zeppelins and the Deep Purples into, and they sort of filtered it and funneled it into something that worked for the 80s. And they were probably one of the most successful bands that did that. Uh, yeah, next to maybe like Tesla. Tesla, Tesla, yeah, Tesla's another one. Right. Another one that definitely, you know, wore the jeans and the T-shirts and had that more 70s look and feel and the song structure that they built on. From right. It, you're right. Great White went more bluesy as the decade went on and yeah. straight ahead rock and roll. They never got into the hairband sound of things. And if you think about it, that's where they were on the cutting edge because think about it, that's where the other bands were going. Poison went bluesy with Native Tongue. Yeah. Cinderella went bluesy with Heartbreak Station. Mm-hmm. Um, so Great White was almost doing that. Uh, and uh, even uh, Brittany Fox, when, um, what's his name, the lead singer? Uh, uh, Dean Davidson did uh, Black Eyed Susan. Black Eyed Susans, he left. Right. Yeah, and that was right. bluesy, so. Once- yeah, and, and Motley Crue kind of led the way, stripping all of that away and off and yeah. uh, with Dr. Feelgood. But I mean, the appearance too, sh- sort of being like, okay, the makeup and the hair and hairspray is too much. We're taking this all away. And once right. other bands started to do the same thing and go back to a more straight rock sound, Great White was able to hang on for a while with uh, the follow-up album Hooked, which was- I almost picked that and then it was 1990 though. So. I know. And- um, so yeah, I, w- I would have picked that. That's my favorite album of theirs. Right um, but with that, and then the follow-up album, um, Old Rose Motel. Hmm. And um, I remember what the one was right after that, but they were able to hold on and still had considerable success despite yeah. the waning hairband movement. And I think it's because of that bluesy sound. They still got radio play. They could make a video. They didn't look like all those hair bands. So I think a lot of people were w- willing to continue on with them. Unfortunately, the industry got to a point where it just completely stopped promoting. Now, it. Great White never made like a grunge sort of album, did they? They did not. Fortunately, no. But they did make an album called, I think it's called Sail Away. Um, and then maybe 95, 96, somewhere in that era. And um, it's an all acoustic album. So it's, uh, you know, MTV Unplugged was really popular at the time. Uh, yeah, it's called Sail Away and was, uh, oh, 94, a little earlier than I thought it was. Uh, so obviously MTV Unplugged was really popular. I met the guys. That's uh, it's hard to see, but signed. Oh, okay. And cool. I asked uh, Mark Kendall at the time, I said, why did you guys make an all acoustic record uh, kind of a thing? I just was so different than everything else. Um, and now he said at the time, he just said, you know, it was a mood they were in and they decided to make an album that all fit in one vein. But because of, uh, you know, how popular, like I said, MTV Unplugged and Unplugged mm-hmm. albums were at the time, I tend to think that's why they did it, thinking that potentially they could, if, you know, their ballads were popular, let's make a whole album of slow right. songs in that sort of vein. I have to get that album. Yeah, it's, it, it's a good album. Uh, definitely recommend. a lot of the bands got heavier and grungier like if you think about skid row came out with subhuman race which was right and then warren came out with doggy dog i want to say and yeah. that was a heavier album so that was good that great white stuck to their guns yeah absolutely i mean you know la guns made their grunge album there was you know uh beyond warrant and doggy dog they did uh belly to belly which was full-on grunge yeah, I mean, there's so many of those hair bands that, uh, you know, well, what, did, what was Def Leppard's uh, uh, slang slang? Actually, that album's not too bad, though. It's not bad. It's just, you know, I've, I've heard a demo of the song slang before it was called slang. And it's so yeah. much better. I mean, I still don't know what the hell does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. I, I always hated songs that had these terms like they were trying to create a sort of catchphrase thing that didn't really catch on. Yeah, um, yeah. I was just going to point out, though, uh, for this album here, for Sail Away, and I don't know if it's still available this way. Um, this was a two disc version with uh, Live in Anaheim. And this oh. one includes ba- Babe, I'm Going to Leave You. It's got the, the, the recording of that on it and uh, definitely worth. So when you get this album, you're getting that track. And, and it was the only um, at the time recording uh, version of it available by them. 
Well, after we are done with this video, I am going to go online and order that. So, yeah, if you've heard if you've heard the radio version of it, it's the live at Anaheim performance Sorry. of Babe, I'm going to leave you that, that got all the radio play at the time, which is why okay. I included it uh, in, in here. Yeah. So, um, all right. Um, getting down to the uh, three of them here. We got uh, next up is uh, King of Sleaze, in my opinion, Rat. We've already mentioned them a few times in here. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm again, I'm a huge Rat fan. I could have gone any which way uh, on, on these records here. Um, you know, my first album was Invasion of Your Privacy. It's got yeah. one of the best album covers ever. That girl oh, yeah. cover, you know. So That's got You're in Love on it as well, right? Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, but I had to go with the third album, uh, Dancing Undercover. Um, this one here, despite uh, not the most inventive album cover on it, um, and this one's produced by Bo Hill, you know, who certainly got uh, really popular for producing Warrant and uh, mm -hmm. Winger and uh, even Twisted Sister and stuff. And he kind of became the, the go-to guy for all of that. Uh, this one here, I just felt was like... Um, uh, you know, a good mix of what was the sort of sleaze sound that they were doing on the earlier stuff that were all, was also more metal on the mm -hmm. earlier ones, mixed with sort of pop 80s. And mm -hmm. it was just a perfect culmination of it here. Um, down and dirty, fun music, every track on it, um, body talk, the opening number, dance, uh, slip of the lip, you know, slip of the lip or slip of the tongue, slip of the lip, yep. Um, just really good tracks. And this is one of those ones that side A, first five tracks that are on this thing. I just, you can't beat it. What mm -hmm. I didn't know at the time though, and again, maybe a reason why I lean towards this album um, versus other ones. I, I mentioned it on the, the ACDC and how tracks from that appeared in movie and soundtrack and stuff like that. Um, I didn't know the song Dance appeared in Miami Vice on an episode. Oh, really? And the song Body Talk appeared in an Eddie Murphy movie, Golden Child, which was a huge huh. movie, yeah, at the time. So it was like, not only were they on MTV, and of course on radio, and probably a, almost at the pinnacle, I think the next album, uh, in terms of their arena status, uh, really reached on, uh, on Reach for the Sky, the, the, um, their next album. But um, this one here, I, I think, was was sort of the culmination, the coming together of all of that sort of sound and everything, and just, you know, best album for them, in my opinion. Well, this is the first band that you and I have agreed on. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Dancing Undercover. I started to think we might not have a match on here. <laughs> this is, well, and I tell you what, this has one of my favorite rap songs, Seventh Avenue, which yeah. is, a, that's a deep cut, but that song is killer. Now, if somebody said to me, what are, what is like typical 80s sleaze, this album, and I would also go with uh, Faster Pussycats debut. Oh, go yeah, the debut, yeah, because I, I would go with uh, uh, the follow-up, uh, what is it, uh, 1989, but. Wake Me When It's Over? Yeah, Wake Me When It's Over. Yeah, I think the first one is even more sleazy. It, it is more sleazy. That's more like L.A. Guns debut. Yeah, but this album, I mean, Rat is just so, so good. Like you said, Dance and Slip of the Lip. One Good Lover, the second track on here is another. One Good Lover, yeah. Um, even the, the, you know, the, the side two, there are no hits. Looking for Love, Seventh Avenue, It Doesn't Matter, Take a Chance, Enough is Enough. But they're awesome songs. I yeah. mean. They all could have been. This was also the first album where they had three singles. Like video yes, that, play, not singles, but I mean, I'm sure radio played more of them. But uh, and Seventh Avenue, like I said, is one of my favorite songs. I don't really like Reach for the Sky, the one that followed this. That I mean, way, way cool junior is a cool song, but outside of that song, that is, I agree, I don't like yeah. that song. That's why I said, I think, in terms of arena status, they were touring the arenas and huge, but that album, yeah. I just I don't like, yeah, this album and then the follow up detonator. Detonator is personally my favorite, but that's a nice Detonator is really good. Yeah. And like you said, that's, that's uh, got a lot of Desmond Child on it as well. Yeah. The whole, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, he produced it and uh, co-wrote a bunch of those tunes. And I want to say to people out there, and I know you've got, you've mentioned these guys before, but if you like Rat and Stephen Piercy, you got to check out the band Arcade. Oh, yes. Stephen Piercy sings for them. And also the drummer, Fred Corey from Cinderella, right? Yep. Absolutely. 
and uh, the guitar it's like, player. It's like Rat 2.0. It's yeah. such stuff. If, if you like Detonator and you like the, they did the a single for uh, the Point Break movie, uh, Nobody yeah. Rides for Free, and that came out in 1991. It was on their uh, greatest hits at the time. Yeah. Like they just continued that. That's that's the exact sound of where and Arcade went. But not a lot of people know about them. Yeah, uh, I mean, Stephen Piercy, I didn't know this until, you know, I started really digging into it kind of a thing. But I mean, Stephen Piercy is the driving force behind the band. Uh, yeah. He writes the bulk of all the songs in there going way, way back to 1977, 78, when they were Mickey Rat, you know, yeah. before they were, uh, you know, Rat with two T's. And yeah. Um, and a lot of the these tracks go way, way back for years. He, he's released demos over the years of recordings like Jakey Lee was in the band, was in Rat. Oh, really? Um, yeah, he's he was their original guitar player, kind of a thing. Somebody, um, I made a comment about Rat, you know, uh, Stephen Piercy has said that uh, he doesn't want to mess with the integrity of the band name, and he really wants the original lineup to reunite and make one more album. And a subscriber of mine or, or somebody following me, you know, said, well, you know, they can't ever reunite the original lineup because Robin Crosby, their guitar player, is dead. Mm. And I was like, well, yeah, OK, we know that. But that doesn't mean you can't have a reunion just because one of the members has passed away. But yeah. I was like, OK, if you want to get technical about it, Robin Crosby's not the original guitar player. Jakey Lee is yeah. kind of thing. And it's like, you know. You want to get technical we'll get technical on it so oh definitely yeah yeah you, yeah you don't mess with brendan when it comes because <laughs> to... <laughs> uh yeah i'll uh, i'll, I'll uh, what do they call it spill the tea <laughs> yeah no there was a lot of cross-pollination with yeah. those bands in the in the early 80s um well yeah, early... uh la guns broke off from like guns and roses and la guns or united in some way as well well yeah so i uh, i mean just tie that story up real quick but yeah um tracy guns and axel okay, rose, yeah. right axel rose was hollywood rose tracy guns was la guns and um la guns lost their singer mm -hmm. and uh hollywood rose lost their guitar player mm -hmm. and both were asking the other person to join and they just decided to join forces and on the hollywood you know sunset strip that was like a super group because they were the two biggest bands around at the time. So for name recognition, they took, uh, you know, the guns from LA guns and Rose from Hollywood Rose, both yeah. happened to be their namesakes uh, as well, put it together yeah. kind of a thing. But apparently Tracy guns only lasted about six months uh, in the lineup. Uh, he got tired of uh, uh, rehearsing and they were supposed to go off on a tour that Duff McKagan had booked for them. Cause remember yeah. Duff McKagan, Kagan came from punk bands and had had success prior right. to to being in the band um and so tracy guns didn't show up they got ready to go for the tour and he didn't show up uh, no show kind of a thing and wow. uh, ultimately uh let them go off and do what they were doing and then decided to reform la guns from there but yeah, yeah. i have a crazy oh, story and all that it's a lot yeah a lot definitely a lot of intertwined uh relationships throughout the music world and especially as the the 90s came on and as you right. mentioned fred corey and arcade but a lot of people don't know uh because they were a smaller band the sea hacks do you, you ever hear oh, yeah. i i have their album on vinyl actually okay well the guitar player for sea hacks is in arcade frank wilsey oh okay i didn't i didn't make that connection cool. so in arcade they changed his name to will sex Mm -hmm. just i guess to be a little more sleazy sounding but we'll yeah. see uh same guy uh so yeah so um and i forget that sea hags, that sea hags album is awesome too that is great that is a you know an underrated gnr gem i mean they're down yeah. and dirty they sound like an early guns and roses kind of a thing really good um, classic case of all the guys were messed up on drugs and mm -hmm. they released the album and they just couldn't hold it together and they just crashed and burned and the cover art is like not what you would typically see in the 80s for that album, but it's no, I, no. It though, so. yeah, no, it must, yeah, definitely was one of those ones that you need the vinyl, the 12 inch album cover to fully uh, appreciate yeah. that. But yeah. yeah, and the same with the other two guys, I let all again less from lesser known bands, but Arcade is a super group. Okay. Um, just got the notoriety for having Stephen Piercy and Fred Corey. Um, Such a great like, band. Yeah, great absolutely. Band. All right, uh, moving on to the next one here. So uh, next band up is a band that started out as a new wave of British heavy metal band, but actually climbed all the way to the top 
And of course, we're talking about Def Leppard. And Chris, I'll let you go uh, first on this one. Yeah, it's funny we'll that you mentioned on this one. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how you mentioned New Wave of British Heavy Metal because I always forget that Def Leppard was part of that because obviously Iron Maiden was there and Tigers of Pantang. Right. And, you know, all those, uh, I think, you know, Saxon and Saxon, right. that, New Wave of British Heavy Metal. And we know where Iron Maiden went. Mm -hmm. And we forget that Def Leppard was part of that. So Def Leppard was actually heavier when they first started. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I grew up with Pyromania because I remember seeing all the videos. I love that album. Of course, I followed them into Hysteria where all the hits were. Um, but I always go back to High and Dry. Okay as my top Def Leppard album. And one simple reason, it's got my favorite Def Leppard song, Bring It On The Heartbreak. I just love that song. Um, I almost went with On Through The Night. I, I, that was I close. It. I almost went with that. I mean, that's gotta be the greatest album cover in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The semi truck with a guitar on it, flying yeah. through space. And <laughs> Rock, Rock Brigade is a great song. Yeah. And, Switch uh, 625. Right. But this is just, I like it. And this is produced by Mutt Lang, who went on to produce yep. Cheyenne. Yep. Um, you know, so the production's there. I think what was good, it, it, it was a nice midpoint between what they were on On Through the Night and what they were going to become with Pyromania, um, which sort of started to begin to shoot them into superstardom. Right. High and Dry was sort of holding on to that new wave of British heavy metal with sort of introducing some pop aspects. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it would become more fully realized on Pyromania. And then of course on Hysteria, we all know what happened with that album. Um, but yeah, I just think that it's, it's, a, it's a heavy album. It flows well, the production as well is good. Um, you know, Lady Strange is a great song. They, what's funny is they've got the song On Through the Night on this album. And yeah, I know. And then I always thought, I was like, did they write it? for the album and it didn't make it, or did they end up writing it after the fact because of the name of the album? I'm not sure, but I tell you what, somebody should have said something about the photo op there. Oh, I know, I, I never liked those. And why I mean, Joe, Joe, Joe Elliott looks like he's on the cover of the Who Tommy. Right. <laughs> but so why I don't know. I, you not know. wearing shirts and two of them are. Yeah, and obviously they hadn't found their look yet. Yeah. Uh, but, it's it's a raw album, but you know you have Mutt Lang producing. Yeah, I just I've always really liked this album a lot. So there we go, high and dry. But so I don't think you agree with me on this one. No, I yeah, you know I had to go with one. I, I mean, I, well, I'm going with Hysteria, and again, yeah. I, this is I think is another obvious choice. And I didn't really want to go with the obvious choice, but this album is just leaps and bounds against all the yeah. others. Now, maybe for different reasons, but it's also was just a complete game changer. Completely Every song was changed, a hit. Yeah, and it just completely changed the industry uh, yeah. for what hard rock or heavy metal could be or that sort of stuff. But you're right. Every song was a hit. And I think for me, though, the biggest thing was that, you know, the album itself, it's, it all comes down to production. It's Mutt Lang produced. And as you mentioned, yes, uh, went on to produce uh, Shania Twain. And of course, you know, they got married eventually. But this album here, it sounds simple. It sounds straight ahead, but it's actually not. It's actually very complex what's going on in this. But I like the fact that it doesn't sound like it's an over the top sort of a thing, an overproduced sort of album. Um, later stuff where they try to replicate uh, hysteria, I think, is where they got into that overproduction sort of thing. But here, um, I don't know, you know, how Mutt Lang did all of this sort of stuff and whatnot, but this album, and it's got, you know, tracks like Gods of War on it. Yeah. I mean, that's a deep cut on it. it, was not a hit single on it. They had seven singles off of this thing. Um, as they And didn't the, the first single didn't take, though, wasn't it? With Women, yeah, women yeah. didn't, and then Animal, and I'm trying to remember if it was, um, what was the third one? Hysteria, maybe? I can't remember, but the first three singles didn't take for this, but in, in the sense that they didn't take, it's like you have to look at it in context. The album had sold three million copies 
uh, in the first, uh, you know, six months, eight months or whatever, where they were saying that the album didn't take, but they had to sell 4 million copies to break mm -hmm. even because they had spent so long recording it and so much money and so forth. But it wasn't until Pour Some Sugar on Me that it actually broke, where they're, at one point, they were selling something like, you know, a million copies a week. Uh, yeah. It ultimately did 19 million copies in the U.S. and is, I don't know what it's done worldwide. I mean, it's it's a humongous album. It's an album amazing album. Yeah. Kind of thing. But um, it, it, this was also the first album that I bought of Hysteria. Um, this, yeah. this goes back to another uh, thing where my brother had given me Pyromania and I fell in yeah. love with Pyromania kind of a thing. But that was something I was getting after the fact. And so yeah. being a fan of Def Leppard by that point now, but you know, only knowing that. And then the radio, you know, started playing women and right. these other songs and hearing them as new songs, a new album was coming and the sort of excitement and everything that went along with it. And then it just exploded. I mean, it became where that, this was the, the album everyone had and it was all over the radio and to be experiencing that through it. I mean, I can't even uh, offer up what a comparison today would be. I mean, maybe, you know, an early Taylor Swift album or something, but it's like right. who, you know, is, a, is an album that took over, it became the zeitgeist. It was, it captured a moment, it changed everything. You know, suddenly bands were scrambling to look, sound, you know, everything like this. Yeah. Um, they were cool, you know, guys liked them, girls liked them, you know, no yeah. longer was, was like only guys showing up at the concerts. It was like now everyone was going kind of a thing. And it just, it became something of the moment. So I don't know, I, I hold a lot of that in with it as, as listening to it. So not only is it a great album and great songs, but for me, it's carrying a lot of that too. So I, I had to go with it. You're right. I mean, that everything you said is exactly right. I mean, all those songs were hits every you the videos were on mtv all the time you know suddenly you could you you're right the guys and the girls like it so suddenly you could listen to it with your girlfriend right you're like yeah hey we both like this album it wasn't like putting on you know like dio or something right exactly <laughs> and it had you're right it, it had that trickle down effect because i want to say around this time judas priest it, it was on Ram It Down, I want to say, where they covered Johnny Be Good, I want to say. Yeah, that's the album. Did Ram It Down come out after Hysteria, I want to say, or something? It, but it, that was 88. Basically, the point is, is that this whole sort of sound that they were creating was affecting everybody. Oh, everybody. Everybody even said the metal, even, the, even the metal bands. Yeah, started layering guitars and going yeah. for this really pristine, polished effect. Um, oh, well, what's weird is that Mutt Lang produced this too, but Hysteria is leaps and bounds in production. So I don't know what happened a couple of Yeah, I, I, I've, I've got conflicting story to counts with that because the way I understand it, it says he produced it, but my understanding is the album was recorded without him and he really only produced two songs on there, Bring It On The Heartbreak and I forget the other one. It's the two okay. that have the remixes at the end. Okay. Um, that he produced those and that got him the gig for producing Pyromania. He called him up and said, it's a great album. I love it, but you can do so much more. And they didn't really believe him. And he was like, let me remix two of your songs and I'll show you what I can do. Yeah. And that's why those songs got re-released. They were Mutt Lang remixes okay. of it. But now, I mean, when you see it, it says he produced it. I can't find yeah. any stories behind it, but my understanding growing up had always been he did not produce the album as a whole. He remixed it. It was later re-released with those remixed versions, but mm -hmm. he only did those two songs. It was uh, Pyromania that was his first full foray with the band. And a little tidbit about this album. I found I finally found it on vinyl. Mm -hmm. So I was listening to it the other day because I, I recently just picked it up. And it, the last song, No, 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 I thought there was a skip at the end because it just kept repeating, repeating, repeating. Right. But then I looked it up and it's just this, it, the way it was pressed, it's a forever skip that just keeps going, going, going until you have to take the needle off. So yeah, it's that was kind of a pretty cool factoid. Yeah, I know. I've, I've, I've found a couple things like that before. And I remember as a kid, and I can't remember the, the albums, but something like that where I'd hear it and I would totally think it was a mistake. Yeah. And, and there was an album that I remember going and returning to the store and getting another one because I thought it was flawed. 
and the second copy of it had it. And I returned it for a third copy before I gave up, only to later find out, no, it was intentional. That sound or skip or whatever it was that was happening in the track was intentional. And that happened. And I'm going to throw a band out here that has nothing to do with this, but Sam Hain. Yeah. Their, their album, November Coming Fire, first pressings of that album, the first song has one of these eternal skips on it. Mm -hmm. And that it was just a pressing flaw in the first, in the first pressing. So yeah, it's interesting what happened with vinyl, but um, that's another video. All right. All right. Yeah. How long is this video so far? Is anybody even still watching? I wonder. I, I don't know. I, I've lost track of time, but I think we're way into it. Uh, we'll wait and see, but I may have to uh, part, do this in parts uh, to upload this thing. We'll have to wait and see. I, I seriously considered it uh, the top five fading out and ending it. But I was like, wait a minute. We told everyone at the beginning we were doing 10. So I, was 10 like, yeah. <laughs> I think we're on like two hours here. And if anybody's still watching it, you're a super fan. You Absolutely. Really, I know. I like I know. Brendan's channel. <laughs> right. This may, may be a series. You may be watching this and now only finding out that we intended it to be one episode. I may post it as 10 parts. I have and no I apologize for anybody who sees me shifting my body, but I'm an old man now and I'm sitting on the floor and my legs are like falling asleep. So if you right. see me shifting, that's what you guys haven't figured out we're both on the floor. I mean, that, my knees have popped up too. And that's yeah. that exact reason. I'm usually only down here for no more than 15 minutes filming a video. So, well, yeah. we're down to the final one and we will wrap this up here. Um, and uh it, this, this brings us to, and I, I don't think you can have a, a, a countdown or a top 10 of anything without this artist in here. And uh, definitely, uh, I don't even think there's an argument to be made here, but the most famous guitar player of all time, of course, talking about Eddie Van Halen, and we'll, we'll show mine, uh, the band Van Halen. Um, so uh, I went first on last one. Chris, why don't you uh, go on this one? I don't think you saw what I flashed there anyway. So Yeah, I didn't. I was looking down at what I, I was subscribers uh, might here. have seen it, but we'll, we'll still go with you first. Okay, so I, I have to go with this album. I know a lot of Van Halen fans probably don't like it because it's the commercial album, but I got to go with 1984. This was the album that introduced me to Van Halen. I mean, I, Jump, Panama. It's got my favorite Van Halen song, Hot for Teacher, on it. It's just, it's just a great album. It just, yeah, produced by Ted Templeman, yeah. uh, which he produced a lot of the stuff. Um, just this is another factoid for people. I didn't realize this. Ted Templeman was part of a band in the 60s called Harper's Bazaar. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So if anybody's into 60s sort of bands that are like a, like the association, check out Harper's Bazaar. Ted Templeman was in that band. I've got mm -hmm. a few other records, too. But and I'm going to tell I'll, I'll say something. And I was talking to Brendan about this. I am not a huge Van Halen fan. Like, I'm just going to admit that. <laughs> yes. I like Van Halen. Mm -hmm. I love Eddie Van Halen. I think they're a great band. I just, they're just not one of my favorite bands. And I also like 5150. I almost picked that as well. But, and I appreciate their early albums. Mm -hmm. um, but I always go, if I'm going to pick a Van Halen, it's, it's this one. And maybe that's because I'm not the biggest Van Halen fan. Maybe that's why I go with this because it's got the hits on it. But I wanted to sort of let the viewers know that. Well, I will say that with with that album, it's it's eight tracks, and there's not a bad track on there. I mean, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, I can't remember the titles now. Drop Drop Dead Legs. Or, drop Dead Legs. Yeah, I'll wait. Drop, drop all gone bad. Or, um, House of Pain. House of Pain. Yeah, I'll wait. I mean, it's just eight Top tracks. E yeah, every single one of them is good. When I listen to that album, it always is over before I know it, like, it's like you're waiting for the lull in the, the album and there's not one. It's just yeah. stupendous. Yeah. Um, I could have easily gone with that. It, that's actually the, um, the first album that I got by them. But for me, at least, I ended up having to go with uh, the Sammy Hagar era and 5150. Okay. And um, So you and I are on the same page pretty much because I almost picked that too. Yeah. And um, I am a bigger fan, I will say, of Van Halen. I mean, they're, they're, I've got other other bands that I'm a bigger fans of than Van Halen, but I'm a big Van Halen fan and I love their stuff, but I'm definitely uh, a fan of the Sammy Hagar era. That's the era I grew up on kind of a thing. I was a huge fan of David Lee Roth's solo mm -hmm. and then went back finding Van, listening to Van Halen with David Lee Roth. But 
to me, it was always, I knew him as a solo artist. So listening to him in the band setting was, was different for me kind of a thing. But this album here, uh, the reason I ended up going with 5150 on it was just that, um, I, I mean, I think it's a slightly more serious Van Halen on it, but I think it's a perfect mix of the 70s uh, sound that they brought into things with that pop of the 80s that they culminated with on 1984. And I think the blending of that here uh, with that being what I was saying is the more, a little bit more serious sounding um, uh, album by them. I, I think, you know, it's, I won't say it's, you know, that, that Sammy Hagar was any less of a party animal than David Lee Roth, but in terms of lyrically, what Sammy Hagar could write and sing versus David Lee Roth, that was the big change, the big difference here on this. Well, the other thing too is, is Sammy Hagar is a singer. Yeah. David, Lee Roth, David Lee Roth is a showman. He's a showman, a front man. I'm not right. saying that David Lee Roth can't sing, right. but Sammy Hagar is a better singer. Absolutely, absolutely. We're talking about and, technically singing. And that's, that's why I think this record did what it did and why they were able to, to move into the sort of upper echelon that they did instead of falling away, having lost their singer. I mean, again, this, is, this was like, you know, uh, a little bit of like a, a super group sort of a thing because Sammy Hagar was super popular. He'd just come off of VOA, I Can't Drive 55, was very successful and of course was famous for having been part of Montrose. Yep. So you lose a big front man like David Lee Roth, but you bring in someone equally star-studded and famous at that point. Um, you know, there was no uh, chance that they weren't going to be successful, but how successful. And then this album here, uh, you know, six times platinum, it, it yeah. goes to number one, which uh, in 1984 did not. It was held out by Michael Jackson's uh, Thriller at the time kind mm -hmm. of a thing, which incidentally, uh, Eddie plays the solo on Beat It. So right. I guess if you have to lose out to being number one, as long as uh, Eddie Van Halen played on Thriller, number two is Van Halen. Then Didn't yeah. Slash play on something that Michael Jackson did too or not? Yeah, he played on the Dangerous album. He played oh, okay, on okay. The, yeah. the guitar solo on Black or White. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that was one thing with Michael Jackson. He always went after really cool guitar players Yeah. over the years kind of thing. But uh, well, yeah. I think 5150 is a great album. I, I, in, I like it better than OU812. Yeah, I um, agree. And yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, opening track, good enough. Um, Sammy Hagar and the Circle just did their own version of that song, which is phenomenal. Uh, but then you've got the hits that are on here. Why Can't This Be Love, Dream, yeah. Love Walks In. And when they went out on tour for this album, they played, I don't know if they played every song, they played nearly the whole album at least because, uh, and I don't know, I think this was a Sammy Hagar thing. He didn't want to do the David Lee Roth hits. So they only ever played a few of them, like Jump um, and uh, Panama, and I, I think um, Ain't Talking About Love. Like that was kind of the three that they would always play. But at that point for, for this uh, album and tour, they really dropped all of that. And so not having a lot of material, um, their uh, Live Without a Net uh, home video, which was a you know VHS at the time kind of thing, I think has all of these songs, if not nearly every song from this album. So it's one of those things like, you really got, you really heard this a lot. If you went and saw them live, if you saw any, you know, performances that they did, listening to it on the radio, uh, a lot of these other songs that didn't, they didn't make videos for, but like uh, Best of Both Worlds was all over radio at the time, kind of a thing. Great song. Yep. So you, yeah, you really got, got hit and hammered with it too, kind of a thing. So for me, at least, even uh, the 1984 is a classic. I mean, can't go wrong. I think I just always associate David Lee Roth with Van Halen. Yeah. It's sort of like how I associate Ozzy with Sabbath. And, you know, I know Ronnie James Dio. I know Ian Gillen. I know like countless other people sang for Sabbath. Right. But Ozzy is Sabbath. That's, that's the. And yeah. for me, David Lee Roth is Van Halen. Again, I like Sammy Hagar, but. Right. Um, if if yeah. I could come up with David Lee Roth singing for them, I'm sure I'd feel the same way. I mean, they're two completely different bands. It's amazing that they didn't have to change their name and were able to be as successful. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the oddities within the music industry, usually you lose a front man and you try to continue on and yeah. the, the singer is going to be the more successful one versus the band who tried to replace some kind of a thing. This was the, the oddity in it. Something superficial though. I, I never liked Sammy Hagar's hair in the beginning. 
Is that oh, like, the, the tight perm? Yeah, perm I was like, hair. no, a lead singer's got to have long hair. Like, I was right, never, right. <laughs> no, it's like, I know it's superficial, but. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. That was his look, you know, his blonde locks, you know, kind yeah, of. A thing. Yeah. But yeah, so, well, we agreed on one album, Rat, Dancing Undercover. Yeah, so uh, there you go. I guess, uh, you know, if you're looking for a, a top, you know, one album out of this 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 might be the one for everyone to go go check out but i was going to ask you so out of all all 10 of the albums do you have a favorite out of uh out of, out of those 10 now which would you th you say is your top favorite out of all of those wow okay um ooh. that's tough uh <laughs> probably should have asked you to, to think about this one in advance but well, okay, so I'm going to narrow it down to these four. Okay. I'll, I'll choose from here. So I'm okay. just going to close out of this one. Yeah, <laughs> out of those, these four, so Motley Crue um, and uh, White Snake, ACDC, and Rat. Um, I'd probably, oh, this, is, this is a tough question here, Brennan. Wow. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, I'm- Put I'm me on the spot. Okay, now I'm narrowing it down to these two. Okay. Dancing Undercover, Flick of the Switch. Man, oh my God. <laughs> I'm going Dancing Undercover. Oh! <laughs> Are you going to do? Yes, yeah, awesome. That's exactly. I'd already thought about this, and I was going to say, you know, when I was debating it, I, I had these in my, um, yeah. my list, but ultimately... I decided the album I go back to more and more times than any other in here is this yeah. rat album, Dancing Undercover. That's amazing that we, that's well, the one we matched on and it's the one we both would select out of all 10 of these. Well, okay, so this is like the quintessential 80s album. Yeah. I think it has everything that you want in the 80s in one album. I agree, yeah. You mentioned a simple cover. I love that cover though. I mean- I guess I just, I, I love, uh, uh, invasion of your privacy and um out of the cellar uh yeah. they, they were albums that the title the art represented the title yeah. whereas this one dancing undercover and it's just got the four pictures of them i don't dislike it it was just i didn't think it was very inventive well maybe they're under the covers but we just can't see it <laughs> right yeah <laughs> who knows i don't know but yeah I, that's funny though you and i we really like this album. Apparently oh my God. so, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, yeah, so that, I mean, yeah, because that, and just to let people know, we did not rehearse that. I was. Yeah, not not at all. I mean, uh, Chris and I yeah. talked in advance, uh, like I said at the top of this, that uh, we pre-selected the 10. Actually, this is my favorite out of them. Yeah, right. The one you didn't, cho yeah. didn't choose. Just kidding. So, you know, I, I have some final thoughts on this. Um, you know, one of the things throughout all that we were talking about and stuff that this was just that the 80s was an era where it seemed like a lot of bands reinvented themselves or a lot of artists reinvented themselves. And that also just in from some of what we selected here, um, you know, bands were um, cut like comebacks because even Def Leppard and Hysteria, they were huge on Pyromania, but it had been four years. Yeah. And Rick Allen had lost his arm. I mean, that was a huge comeback, four years in the 80s was an eternity you yeah. know so the fact that they were able to come back and be bigger than we had Aerosmith doing it basically three times I mean they came back with done with mirrors but I mean they yeah. rose higher when they did it on permanent vacation and people thought you can't top that and they just did it again with pumps so I mean you know people kept writing them off and you know ACDC you could say the same thing about with back in black but there's a lot of that that was going on in the 80s and i also yeah. think within the 80s uh artists like with aerosmith and acdc and alice cooper there was a lot of the old guard who were coming in and showing they could hold their own with the younger bands the newer bands that, that were only starting out in the 80s and doing that style of stuff and you had you know aerosmith coming in and you know showing uh hair bands or you know the poisons or the whatever you know that had only sprung up in the wake of all of this stuff hey you know we we created this stuff originally back in the 70s and we can do right. this just as good as you kind of a thing but and ultimately these albums i mean all all of these albums that uh, we've just talked about here i think have held up 
over yeah. the course of uh, time. I mean, not, you know, from the 80s to the 90s into where we are today. It's like, these are still some of the biggest selling albums of the industry. Um, you know, well, the other thing too, is if you put this ACDC album on for some teenagers nowadays, they're going to like it. Yeah, they won't. If you don't tell them this was from, that was it 83 or? Uh, 84? 83. Yeah, it's like, you know, if you don't tell them that it's that, I mean, you could put it on and tell them that it was, uh, you know, I don't know, Greta Van Fleet or something, or, you know, I yeah. don't know, those other bands that, you know, is doing that sort of stuff. And it's like, you tell them it's some some young new band and it's like, they'll, they wouldn't know because the stuff is classic. But I'm going to tell you, I think this is probably the only one out of here that you could probably do that with, because at least my choice is like, mm -hmm. The other ones I feel like can be a little dated. Yeah. Uh, but your Def Leppard Hysteria, though, that's one if you put on now, people would would like. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But, but like it, my high and dry is a little dated. Well, but this is this is dated in the sense that if you put it on, people will love it because this style, this sound is in fashion again. But yeah. this is absolute 80s sounding. I mean, the electronic drums on here. Um, but you're right, everything in here with the exception of probably my ACDC is dated to the eighties in terms of the sound, but I, and I, like, I like the, well, this is sound. what is so great about ACDC is that it doesn't matter what freaking year it is. Yeah. When ACDC comes out with a new album, just like their latest album, I yeah. guess the title is me power up. power up, power up. It still sounds fresh. Right. Absolutely. And that's There's why that something album... about that, that ACDC chemical thing they have going on, it just works. doesn't matter if it's 1982 or 2002 or 2021 or, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, they started in 1975 and, and look at them here, 45 years later, they're still doing it and it still works. And Power Up album, it entered at number one. Yeah, so when you it's can a great album. Four years into it and enter at number one with a rock record like that, I, I think yeah. that is saying something, so... Yep. All right. I think uh, we'll bring this to a close here. Um, I'd like to thank Chris Profi from Musically Obsessed for joining me here. Uh, make sure to ch head over to his channel. Check him out. As I uh, mentioned earlier, he's a great uh, um, counterpoint to, to my channel here where I focus a lot on CDs. And Chris does love CDs and does that, but he's a big vinyl person. So if you've been looking for a, a vinyl thing, definitely check out Chris. And uh, as always, please remember to comment, like, and subscribe. And uh, everyone have a great day. We'll talk to you all real soon. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. All right. I don't know how to end it. <laughs>